What are trumler called yeah. in English? <laughs> drums. 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 Okay. So it was cable drums. That was. Cable right. drums, yes. We're just talking about. I was impressed by how big they were. And he was like, "No, those are the yeah, small ones." Small ones. <laughs> Cable drums are those big, cylindrical reels that store, distribute, and also retrieve cables. You've probably seen them at festivals, in your dad's garage, or even as a makeshift wooden table. But beyond that, they play a crucial role in the green transition. Not the drums themselves so much, but the cables that they carry. And if you're a company that constantly has to bang the drums for how vital cables are, it certainly helps to have some very big ones right in your backyard. Luckily, NKT does. This is Next Stop, Green Business. I'm Maria Lindarlot with State of Green, and I'm on the road across Denmark visiting companies that prove climate action and competitiveness go hand in hand. From factories to service stations to sleek HQs, every stop brings a new perspective on why green business is good business. And I'm taking you along for the ride. Windmills and electrical cars have become symbols of the green transition. But they wouldn't work if there weren't cables connecting them to the grid, to chargers, and ultimately to our everyday lives. And no one knows this better than the Danish cable pioneer NKT. It, it is, as we talked about earlier, it, it is a forgotten or it has been a neglected element of the green transition. But in, in recent years, there's, there's more and more focus on it because uh, a lot of these transition system operators, they've kind of realized, Jesus Christ, you know, look at all the renewable energy that's coming our way. We're going to have to, uh, you know, build our grid so it can mm. absorb it. This is Anthony Abbotts, head of group sustainability at NKT. He took me on a tour of their factory in Esnes, where we talked about why cables are the true backbone of the green transition. They form the infrastructure that carries green power from where it's produced to where it's needed. And with international climate goals resting on electrification, the scale of the expansion required is almost hard to grasp. I mean, if we look at uh, one of the latest reports from the International Energy Agency, uh, IEA, they have calculated that by 2040, we're gonna need to build and install 80 million kilometers of cable. That is just absolutely enormous. That urgent need to connect the energy system is reflected in NKT's own growth. Between 2020 and 2025, their revenue rose by 130%, and their EBITDA, the core operating profit, by more than 500%. And as Anthony can attest to, it's quite electrifying, pun intended, to experience this kind of new dawn for an old business. I, uh, I often call it a, uh, an, old, an old startup. That's what I call it, because I mean, it's a company that's been around since 1893. Editor's note, it's actually 1891, but continue, Anthony. But it has that feeling of, uh, it's like a, it's, it's a, a startup because of that growth that we're that we're going through at the moment. Mm. So it's quite a quite an interesting paradox. Constant reinvention. Yeah. The real paradox for NKT in this phase is the following. To electrify and decarbonize the energy system, we have to reduce more cables pretty rapidly. But while NKT is enabling the shift to renewables, the production of their products still carries an emissions footprint. In other words, doing the right thing can still look wrong on paper. So, so in order for us to get to net zero, we have to strengthen the grid. That will lead to short, medium term emissions, but that will mean that at some point we'll get to net zero. Those emissions we're accounting for as a cable manufacturer. And uh, when I came into the company, we were almost apologetic about the, the increased emissions that we had um, because that didn't look good. When we talk about climate impact, the footprint often takes center stage. Emissions, resource use, and so on. But companies like NKT also leave a different kind of mark, a so-called handprint. One that enables progress, connects clean energy, and helps others lower their emissions. And while it may be harder to measure, it's important to talk about to tell the full story of how businesses participate in the green transition. 
months. But, uh, but you know, I've, I've been in the company now for just over a year. And I have to say that one of my first re reflections when I came in 10KT was that we didn't really talk about the handprint. We didn't really talk about the, the enormous positive impact that we were uh, uh, generating in society. It was more about the footprint. But, but the, the thing is that the negative impact, so the, the higher emissions, are a direct consequence of us contributing to the green transition. Still, that doesn't excuse Anthony and his team from doing what they can to lower NKT's emissions. Like most of the companies in this series, NKT has ambitious targets. But hitting ambitious SBTIs isn't something they can do on their own, as Anthony made clear with a concrete example. If we, if we look at scope one and two, so we have a target for 2030 to reduce scope one and two emissions by 90%. Mm. Um, we're up to 67%. When you look at the remaining 23%, then a large part of that comes from the marine fuels mm. that we're using and our cable laying vessels uh, to transport and install uh, cables offshore. Yeah. The big challenge we have is the availability and the cost of these fuels. And at the moment, because the delta between the MGO price and the sustainable fuel price is so big, then it's very difficult to get our customers to say we'll pay for it. Yeah. From sourcing green fuels to sourcing the scarce raw materials used in cables, the availability and cost of solutions can limit what's possible, even when technology exists to reduce emissions. And those types of challenges cannot be solved by individual companies. It's an industry-wide challenge, yeah. basically. It's not something that NKT can fix. It's something that the industry needs to, to fix. And there are other examples of these, you know, you could say, uh, gridlocks or bottlenecks uh, that uh, that where we need value chain collaboration. Mm. We need a more uh, kind of uh, industry wide approach because otherwise these systemic challenges they, they they will not be addressed. One thing that could be a helpful signal to spur this kind of shift in value chains would be to elevate sustainability as a competition criteria for project tenders. As a company that often participates in big public project tenders, NKT can attest to the uneven value currently assigned to sustainability. As part of the criteria for those tenders, sustainability is weighted. Now the weighting varies uh, depending on which TSO it is. In Norway, currently the weighting for sustainability is 30%. So 30% of the tender criteria is towards sustainability criteria. Uh, or sustainability performance. And then in, in, in other countries, you will have a lower level there. Sometimes you have 0%, sometimes you have 10%. I would say the average is around 10%. The, the, clearly the trend is that it's going up, um, but we would uh, clearly uh, ask for a higher focus on the sustainability uh, in, the, in the tenders. For companies like NKT, aligning with international climate goals means real investments in technology and talent. But those efforts only pay off if everyone is held to the same standard. While European companies face strict sustainability requirements, many of their competitors don't, even when bidding for the same projects. Creating a level playing field is thus essential to build a competitive green economy. What we've got to be careful about is diluting. Because if we start diluting, that means suddenly that uh, sustainability is no longer a differentiator. And, and I think that we'll be shooting ourselves in the foot uh, from a European industry perspective, but I think we'll be shooting ourselves in the foot from a societal perspective because climate, the climate crisis, that doesn't, they, uh, the climate crisis doesn't care about what the political gender is at the moment and, and nor does the biodiversity crisis. So um, it's not going to go away. It's actually going to get much worse. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think that companies that, that maintain their focus on sustainability will be the winners. Dialing down sustainability sends the wrong signal to markets, to competitors, and to future generations. 
and at the end of our tour of the Asnes factory, Anthony made clear that that last part is the true reason why he believes that companies have no real choice but to keep banging the drum for green business. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a father to, uh, to, to, to two children and, uh, you know, at some point they'll probably also have children. Unfortunately, it's going to be extremely tough for that generation um, and, and, and the next generation uh, because things are going to get much worse before they get better. Um, and therefore, it is essential that companies are con continuing to drive the, the green agenda. Thanks to Anthony Abbotts and the team at the Asnes factory for showing us around. Ensuring that the world is worth inheriting for the next generation is essentially about turning long-term climate concerns into long-term green investments. And it just so happens to be the day job at our next stop, Pinch Denmark. We'll see you there. <laughs>